Here we are in the future. Here we are in the future, and it's... Oh, it's already over. I can't believe we're done the show. Never ending hiatus, here we go. Steven Universe has been done for over a year, but the show has made an unprecedented move of making its endgame a movie and a separate limited run series. Confused? Well, you're in the right place. Hi, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're going through 107 facts about Steven Universe the movie and Steven Universe Future. Grab a homemade cookie cat, a few tissues for both melted ice cream and tears, and let's get started. Oh, and there will be spoilers. You've been warned. Fact number one. Even before season five was over, it was clear by the summer of 2018 and Reunited's cliffhanger that Rebecca Sugar's Steven Universe was in endgame territory, but fans hadn't been notified that the show was ending leaving many to wonder what was next. Our first clue came at Comic-Con in July 2018 when Sugar announced Steven Universe the movie. Number two. For how plot-heavy the show eventually became, Cartoon Network didn't originally want Steven Universe to be a show with a continuous plot. They were more interested in self-contained episodes. Sugar and her team slipped it in by focusing on placing pieces of the larger puzzle in satisfying one-shot episodes and then bringing them together. Number three. Things changed by the time the Crewniverse, an adorable term for Steven Universe's crew, was working on the Peridot Barn arc. At the beginning of the season, Cartoon Network started ordering large bursts of plot-related episodes, Steven Bombs, if you will. Coincidentally enough, Sugar and company were already planning the arc that way. Number four. That doesn't mean that the world threading together happened on the fly. Sugar and her writers were actively writing scenes that were happening outside Steven's point of view, like conversations the other Crystal Gems were having without him. Sugar even had a guide to every fusion in the show since the beginning. Number five. Sugar has, quote, tomes and tomes of the history of the show's alternate version of Earth, and it's hidden away until Steven needs to know it. Like how Hollywood is in Kansas because Disney's Laugh-O-Gram Studios took off, so Disney never had to move, which is why Jamie wants to be an actor in Kansas. Number six. Because the gems invaded 6,000 years ago, the geography of the world and the names of places are different. For example, Beach City is in Delmarva, a state which is made up of real-life Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland, and Canada is just called the Great North, which isn't too far from reality, actually. Number seven. The idea for the movie goes back to the show's second season in 2015 when Sugar was headed to Japan. Japan. Like so many of us, she got screwed over by a phone restore that completely wiped her phone's memory. Tons of drawings and videos from the formative years of the show by herself and others were immediately gone. Number eight. But from that unfortunate situation, Sugar got an idea. What would happen if these characters were restored to factory settings and all their progress got wiped? Which is especially potent since we're talking about a show that's entirely about the characters' personal progressions. I think Peridot put it best in the movie when she said, I could have lost all my character development. Number nine. Cartoon Network asked Sugar to pitch a film that same year. In order for the film to be picked up for production, Sugar had to persuade the network with storyboards, imitations of character voices, and explanations on how music would weave into the narrative. Sugar describes this period as intense. Number 10. Sugar was in a huge catch-22 for writing the music for the film. She wasn't able to start writing anything until she knew that the story was approved. She then had to race against the clock to create an album of demos that the Crewniverse could storyboard to. Number 11. For so many reasons, the ramp-up to the film was a huge endeavor for the Crewniverse. The season 5 finale, Change Your Mind, was the longest episode the show had ever done. The team felt that not only did they have to keep the cylinders firing, but to fire them harder. Number 12. The team only got one month of rest between finishing Change Your mind and starting the film, but Sugar wasn't able to take a break because she used that single month to write 15 or 16 songs for the film. A month! That's like a song every two days! Number 13. Sugar then flew to Chicago for two days to meet with co-executive producer Chance the Rapper. She also collaborated with him to write True Kinda Love. Number 14. True Kinda Love was the first song on the soundtrack to be finished, and Sugar was wildly inspired by Chance. Sugar had always thought of music as notes and chords, as one would assume, but Chance kept talking about True Kinda Love love with the image of a kid swinging their arms as they walk. Number 15. Fans went crazy when they learned that the film would take place two years after Change Your Mind, which means that Steven would be 16. As traditionally occurs when anyone turns 16, for the first time, our beloved Steven earned a neck. Number 16. For all the hubbub around the neck, and there was a lot, even I made a joke about it in our last Steven Universe video, the team had set up how an older Steven might look in earlier episodes. And no, I'm not talking about the episode So Many Birthdays. Days. Although maybe, maybe, maybe that's how he'll look. But no, I'm talking about the season two episode Steven's birthday, where Steven's willfully aged up body is a dead ringer for his actual 16 year old body. Dude, your neck. Oh, uh, what about it? 
You have one! Number 17. But everyone on the team was just as excited as we were about the neck, largely because for animators it was often a pain to figure out how Steven's head was connected to his body and his younger, neckless design. Number 18. Sugar herself was so excited about the neck that she had to keep herself from drawing the updated Steven design at cons because at the time, the time skip and redesign were still under wraps. Number 19. Sugar also wanted to give Steven a cool jacket as a direct nod to his voice actor, Zach Callison. Apparently, Callison has a fleet of sweet jackets he's sporting all the time. He's very fashion forward that way. Number 20. A ton of other research and development was involved in the film. For two years, Sugar and her partner, Ian Jones Cordy, would watch films and musicals based on TV shows, taking extensive notes as to why they did or didn't work. Number 21. If you're wondering about the outcomes of Sugar's research, she came to the objective conclusion that a goofy movie was a prime example of an excellent film based on a TV show. The script then says I'm supposed to affirm that a goofy movie is the best, but I haven't actually seen it yet. Please don't murder me. I know the songs by heart, at least um, th those are amazing. Number 22. Sugar also thinks that Beavis and Butthead Do America is a great example of adapting a TV show to a movie. And if that seems surprising, what might be even more is that two animation directors on Steven actually worked on Beavis and Butthead. Number 23. One thing Sugar thought worked came from legendary director choreographer Bob Fosse. A character has to be feeling something so strongly that they're compelled to sing, and when that's not enough, they're compelled to dance, which keeps a musical from feeling like an endless parade of songs. Number 24. Sugar and the team built two musical practice runs into the show. One was the musical episode Mr. Greg, and the other was the song For Just One Day Let's Only Think About Love, where the team was purposefully testing themselves to see if they could pull off the most musically musical musical number that ever musicaled. They came pretty close, but I still think the most musically musical musical number that ever musicaled is either We Go Together From Greece or Defying Gravity From Wicked. They've had the advantage of time to burn into our memories. Number 25. To further illustrate Sugar's love for turning the show into a musical, she recently described Mr. Greg as her all-time favorite episode. The Crooniverse got absolutely no extra time on it compared to a normal episode, so its excellence is entirely a labor of love. Number 26. By the way, that wedding arc was a long time coming. Sugar had been pitching it since 2016, and it had been fighting against imposed ceilings regarding Ruby and Sapphire's relationship since Jailbreak in 2014. Sugar deeply believes in the importance of LGBTQIA plus representation in media, and the powers that be all eventually had to hop on. There's no stopping the Stephen train or the sugar shack. Is there like a fan thing for that kind of like a, like a Steven Universe hype train? Number 27. The other big question for the film was who the main antagonist would be. The widely circulated theory before the release of the first poster was that the villain would be Aquamarine because she was entirely missing from the wrap-ups in season five. Number 28. However, the villain of the film was later revealed to be Spinel, an entirely new character played by Sarah Stiles. Stiles said during a panel at 2019's New York Comic Con that while Sugar wrote tons and tons of pages for Spinel's audition breakdown, Stiles' manager apparently boiled the character description to something like a psychotic Betty Boop. Number 29. If Spinell does remind you of Betty Boop, that's exactly what Sugar was going for. Fleischer Studios, which was started in 1921 and is responsible for characters like Betty Boop and Popeye, created a lot of Sugar's all-time favorite animations, and she has a soft spot specifically for Betty Boop. Number 30. Sugar also wanted to use Spinell to pay homage to the UB iWorks bounce. iWorks worked closely with Walt Disney and is basically credited with creating Mickey Mouse. And that bouncy, playful aesthetic that characterizes animation from that era was entirely his idea. Number 31. The whole reason for that rubber hose 1930s vibe is that Sugar wanted to accentuate the fact that Spinell is old and was frozen in time. She wasn't given the opportunity to develop like all the other characters, so she both looks and moves like she's out of place. Number 32. While Sugar is a huge fan of those 30s cartoons, she also feels there's something unsettling and toxic about them because of the norms of the times they were made in. Sugar wanted to work in some of that difficulty into the vibe of the character. Number 33. Spinell may be inspired by rubber hose cartoons, but she's borrowed a move from another poster boy of dodgy animation, Sonic. She runs and spin dashes like Sonic and uses her legs like a propeller, which is reminiscent of Tails' famous move. Number 34. However, some of Spinell's attacks share commonalities with much more recent cartoons. Her stretching ability is reminiscent of both Jake from Adventure Time, which Sugar worked on, and Monkey D. Luffy from One Piece, which Sugar is known to be a huge fan of. You could even argue that Spinell's big punch against Steven was basically... <laughs>
Number 35. The concept of Steven clashing with and not fitting in with older cartoon tropes didn't start with Spinel. It was also a key part of his experience with the Diamonds on Homeworld, which involved a lot of old fairy tale concepts. Think about it, the pebbles are basically Cinderella mice who make him a dress for the ball. The ball does not go well, if, if you needed a reminder. Number 36. Actually, anime played into Spinel in more ways than one. Some anime films will have a strange new character pop up and suddenly become the most important character. Spinel's a parody of that trope, because any expectation of suddenly inserting yourself in Steven's life after everything the Crystal Gems went through is just silly. Number 37. Initially, Sugar didn't want to give Spinel eyelashes, since eyelashes can be pretty tropey. So instead, in an effort to turn that trope on its head, Sugar gave Spinel those upside down lashes, which look like mascara after you've been crying. Number 38. Speaking of crying, story of my life, Spinel's heartbreaking backstory was inspired by the same incident that was behind Sugar's highly memorable song from Adventure Time, Everything Stays. She found a long lost stuffed animal in her yard after a year and realized that things still change even in stillness. Not necessarily for the worse though. Apparently it was quite the formative memory for Sugar. Number 39. Equally heartbreakingly, Spinel is also partially influenced by the young kids who grew up watching Steven Universe and then grew out of the show, yet the Crewniverse is still there, still working on the show, still trying to be entertaining. Number 40. Sugar fully knows that Spinel can be overwhelming and grating. Pink ditched Spinel because Spinel was given to placate her and Pink wanted to feel like she was moving forward. Pink tended to not think about how her actions affected others, a recurring theme for her, as Sugar put it. Number 41. Spinel is the first character in Steven Universe that just flat out wants to hurt people, but because she's in so much pain. Sugar wanted the opportunity to explore all the dimensions of that complicated set of emotions. She even says that viewers feeling frustration towards Spinel is a totally fair reaction. Number 42. Since so many members of the crew universe are marginalized individuals, Spinel is meant to express the utter ridiculousness and one-dimensionality of thinking that someone else deserves to exist less, or of taking out your anger on totally unrelated parties. Number 43. Spinel's feelings are exaggerated because she's a cartoon and can be made to literally poison people, but she was inspired by attempts to interact with people who have had dramatic experiences that make it hard for them to trust other people and sometimes even actively want to hurt others. Number 44. Sugar wanted to set up a situation where Steven couldn't help someone, and so has to realize that the best way to deal with the situation is to protect himself. He can't convince Spinel to change because she needs to decide if she wants to change herself, a theme that would pop up again in Steven Universe Future, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Number 45. A lot of that idea was informed by Sugar's conversations with an anti-bullying expert who collaborates with Cartoon Network. Talking with him shaped how Sugar approaches writing because the difference between an interpersonal conflict and a bully is that a bully wants to hurt someone. Number 46. But there was a moment where it looked like Spinel might not make it into the movie at all. Since her humor is so animation specific and tied to visuals, Sugar had an incredibly difficult time explaining the humor and importance of Spinel to Cartoon Network execs. Number 47. On a lighter note, fans were shocked by Steven and Greg's fusion, but the Crooniverse has wanted to put him out since season one. There are many episodes about him that just never made it all the way into development. That fusion's name, by the way? Steg, but I personally prefer Grieven because it reminds me of General Grievous. This fusion will make a fine addition to my collection. Number 48. In particular, Sugar found notes from around 2013 or 14 for a Battle of the Bands episode with Steg where he was called Mr. Multiverse. Steg was always going to be this rock star radiating support and confidence. Number 49. Appropriately, Steg is voiced by an actual rock star, Ted Leo, and even more appropriately, Steg has a duet with Opal, who's voiced by Amy Mann, another rock star. What's more, Mann and Leo work together frequently and have a project called The Both. Number 50. Amy Mann was more than just a big name, Get. She was actually a huge influence on Sugar. As a teenager, she would listen to man's music while she drew comics. Number 51. So it was a dream come true for Sugar to co-write Drift Away with Man, with Man providing the bridge. Sugar was having trouble writing sad enough lyrics, and so the two of them went back and forth, pitching sadder and sadder lyrics. Sounds like my kind of night. Number 52. By the way, you probably guessed that the film's Disney fairy tale like opening wasn't animated by the normal studio. Instead, it was made by Chromosphere, the same studio who animated the Steven Universe Dove self esteem shorts. PSAs on Cartoon Network, where Steven Universe characters coached viewers through self esteem issues 
issues and body confidence. Number 53. Sugar wanted the takeaway from the film to be that it's okay to be a work in progress. There's this sort of false promise made by stories that there's gonna be an end, but you don't stop growing. If you wanted to stop growing, it's gonna be really hard when bad things keep happening. 2020 mood. And very much on that note, number 54. Part of what Sugar wanted to show with the movie is how much Steven has grown up and how the events of Change Your Mind allowed him to shed a lot of his insecurity. But there's obviously a lot more to explore there, and the Crooniverse couldn't explore everything they wanted to in just one movie. Number 55. But after the movie came out, there was an eerie silence from both Cartoon Network and the Crooniverse on whether there would be a new season. After the film's release in September of 2019, fans had absolutely no idea what the future of the show was. Number 56. Exactly what was coming next was anyone's guess until New York Comic Con in October of 2019 when Sugar announced there is no season six. Number 57, in its place, Sugar announced that Steven Universe Future would be a limited series that would serve as the epilogue. That's just the cheekiest move to word it the way she did. Ugh. Number 58, but why isn't it season six? Well, season five marked the end of the initial story that Sugar and her team set out to tell. There was an epic finale that capped it. Steven Universe Future is a different story in many ways. Number 59. From the beginning, Sugar and her team thought of Steven Universe, the OG show, as a coming of age story. They thought of it as a show written from Steven's point of view, but by adults who knew things about life that Steven still had to learn about. Number 60. However, it turns out adults don't really have many answers. The Crooniverse wanted to express that through the gems, whose world feels very abstract and metaphorical to begin with. But the more Steven understands how gems work, the more mature he becomes. Number 61. Steven Universe Future, original Steven Universe, and its various incarnations have always been done on paper. The colors are digital, but the pencils and inking and everything relating to character motion, that's all done by hand. Number 62. Sugar adores a writing process driven by storyboards, especially since that practice harkens back to the golden age of cartoons. Since animation is a visual medium, Sugar loves seeing the story come to life, not just through words, but by characters' expressions and postures. Number 63. If this wasn't already obvious, Sugar deeply values her team. She learned on Adventure Time that a team brings a ton to a show, so big decisions on Steven are made collaboratively. Number 64. That doesn't mean it's always easy, though. There have been a number of heated arguments among the Crooniverse, but the show always comes out better for it. In fact, the climax of Change Your Mind with the two Stevens was the result of an intense argument. Number 65. One signal that Steven Universe Future was a completely new series is the theme song. Gone is the five-season classic we we are the Crystal Gems. Instead, at the 2019 New York Comic Con, Sugar announced the new series with its new opening sequence, which is set to a retooled version of Happily Ever After from the movie. Number 66. Steven Universe Future isn't dismantling the Happily Ever After that the movie set up with some big new baddie, though. Instead, the series does something shows never do. Show the very personal battles with trauma and the struggle to find normalcy after the big climactic battle. Number 67. Sure, the show digs into what life is like now in Era 3, i.e the era where gem wars have halted and peace takes hold, but the notion of spending a show's entire final season with the character confronting the trauma he incurred during the rest of the series has honestly never been done before, not that I can remember at least. Number 68. Heartbreakingly and ironically, Sugar even acknowledges that Steven's behavior in future is specifically not unlike Pink Diamond's behavior before him, meaning he's avoiding difficulties within himself. Number 69. Sugar and her writers were actually just as confused about what should be next for Steven as Steven is in the show. They landed on the idea that Steven would want to get married because he loves weddings and he loves love and, you know, doesn't that just make sense? Number 70. Hence the events of Together Forever. Sugar and the writers figure that since Connie has so much more figured out and since Steven has not taken his own time to do that, just disappearing into their relationship would be appealing to him. Number 71. But before we get there, we have to build up Steven's uncertainty over the course of several episodes. He also has to knock it all on our brains that he's old enough to drive now. Fans with excellent in memory will recognize his car as Greg's Donde Supremo, the dream car he purchased in Beach City Drift. Number 72. He also might have noticed that Connie's studying pose is a dead ringer for our hero, the lo-fi hip-hop beats to study relax to girl. The girl, by the way, was inspired by this scene from the 1995 Studio Ghibli film Whisper of the Heart, which makes it a doubly on-brand reference for this show to make. Number 73. For another memory test, you might recall that Bismuth mentions her pal Snowflake in her titular episode. Bismuth believes
believes that Snowflake was shattered during the rebellion, but we learn in Change Your Mind that she was actually corrupted and now she's good as new. Number 74. That might all serve to explain why Snowflake has been a supporting cast member of choice in Little Homeschool, and perhaps why Snowflake gets the honor of being voiced by Ian Jones Cordy. Number 75. Though perhaps the award for best newly uncorrupted gem should go to Larimar, who loves screams to a disturbing degree. Larimar is voiced by Dee Bradley Baker, a legendary voice actor who has voiced tons of random characters on the show, most notably Lion and Frybo. Number 76. Since Rose Quartz wasn't actually a Rose Quartz, the three Rose Quartz that we meet in Rosebuds are the first actual Rose Quartz we meet in the show, since all Rose Quartz gems were bubbled in Pink's Zoo as a reaction to the rebellion. Number 77. All three Rose Quartzes are voiced by Kimberly Brooks, who has been the show's go-to actress for Quartz and Jasper soldiers. She also plays the Jasper, the one that we're so familiar with. Number 78. In Volleyball, we learn that Pink Pearl was under White Diamond's control for 8,000 years after her time with Pink Diamond, which means that we now finally know that our Pearl is 8,000 years old. I love your energy. It reminds me of when I was younger. I'm older than you. Number 79. The villain everyone was expecting to epically show up in the movie did eventually show up, but not quite as epically. Bluebird introduces Bluebird Azurite, the fusion of Aquamarine and Eyeball. I especially love that Aquamarine still calls Greg my dad, a callback to her debut in season four's Are You My Dad? Number 80. Assuming there's a large overlap of fans of Steven Universe and OKKO OK Let's Be Heroes, you may have noticed that Bluebird Azurite kind of sounds like Koala Princess or Miss Pastel. They're all voiced by by the same actress, Larissa Gallagher. Number 81. You probably picked up on the fact that Rainbow's tidying song is a nod to Mary Poppins, but you may have missed a much more obscure bit of trivia. The blackbird outside the window is not an American blackbird, but a European blackbird, a very subtle nod to the fact that an American robin appears during a spoonful of sugar, despite the fact that the movie takes place in London. There's also a Monty Python and the Holy Grail reference to be made here if we change the blackbird to a swallow, but I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud right now. Number 82. Rainbow Rainbow Quartz 2.0 is voiced by Alistair James, who other than Steven Universe is probably best known for Randy Siminoff from Bones. Not counting our beloved Steven, James is the first male identifying voice actor to voice any gem, first appearing in Change Your Mind. Number 83. If you look real hard in Onion's kitchen, you can see a box labeled... <sighs> Revolutionary Grill Utensils, a reference to Revolutionary Girl Utena, an anime that Sugar is a very vocal fan of. I don't know why I'm groaning, it's a great show. I think I'm groaning at the pun, mostly. Number 84, in Sunstone Strange, hang on. Sorry, I think the script meant to say legendary epilogue to a very special episode. They're on a set which looks similar to the one in the Dove Self-Esteem Project shorts. Unrelated, but does anyone else literally only think of Toe Jam and Earl when Sunstone is on screen, or is that just me? Number 85. Once the fusion started joining the game of Steven Tag and Snow Day, almost everyone probably recognized that the style of those title cards is quite reminiscent of Super Smash Bros. Though why they slept on Steven Joins the Battle or some other clever wordplay that I'll come up with while editing this video I'll never know. Number 86. Snow Day also marks the first time Pearl is shapeshifted that we know of since the events in A Single Pale Rose, where she shapeshifted into Rose to fake the shattering. Number 87. The way that Lapis assumes a giant water form in Why So Blue may be a nod to a climactic Avatar Aang battle in Avatar The Last Airbender. Regardless, you can't dispute the fact that it looks pretty rad. I know she's not supposed to be doing it, but it looks pretty rad. Number 88. Adorably, all of the pastries at Lars's new bakery, Space Trees, have space-themed puns for names. For example, you can experience the chocolate ship cookie, total eclipse of the tart, the croissant moon, or the red dwarf velvet cake. Number 89. In Little Graduation, we're introduced to Shep, who's the show's first non-binary character besides Stevani or any of the other fusions. Number 90. Shep is voiced by India Moore, an actor and model who's also non-binary. They're best known in the TV world for playing Angel in the awesome FX series Pose. Also, go watch Pose. Number 91. But yes, in case you were wondering, Cartoon Network confirmed that Stevani is intersex and non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. Number 92. Also, storyboard artist Maya Peterson revealed after the episode in Dreams that Peridot is asexual and aromantic. Her interest in Camp Pining Hearts is purely for the thrill of Camp Pining Hearts and also shipping. Uh, sorry, Lapidot shippers. Number 93. We get a glimpse of Steven's gaming setup in In Dreams and it looks very much like 
like he has a PS2 and DualShock 2 controllers. And the game on the right sure does look a lot like Katamari Damacy. I still really need to pick up a copy of that. Number 94. Steven's dream character, Stefan, kinda sorta actually looks like a tanner and fitter version of the adult form he assumed way back in Too Many Birthdays, where notably he had a t-shirt that said Beach Hunk. The teen version in that episode, though, uh, had, a, had a bit, um, wasn't quite there yet. Number 95. A few of the people hanging out at the roller rink in Bismuth Casual are actually animated versions of the Crewniverse members. Ian Jones Quarty, storyboard artist Lamar Abrams, and supervising director Kat Morris. Number 96. More Crewniverse cameos also happened in Guidance. Storyboard revisionists Nicole Rodriguez and Liana Nichura were seen riding Funland's Ferris wheel before things go horribly awry. Number 97. A few fans were curious as to why Ruby and Sapphire were so gung-ho about Steven proposing to Connie, yet Garnet had more measured advice. Sugar explains that Ruby is just a hopeless romantic and thinks that anything works when you enthusiastically rush in. And in Sapphire's experience, she's seen love actually alter fate, so she really thinks the proposal could work. Number 98. The explanation also involves some nitty gritty understanding of Garnet's future vision. Sapphire can only see one track and it only works when she's totally passive. Since Ruby is so impulsive when they come together as Garnet, Garnet can see multiple tracks that are shaped by her actions. Number 99. Steven's ridiculously cute and retroactively hard heartbreaking song for Connie includes lyrical nods to two other romantic songs from the series, Ruby's wedding vow to Sapphire and Reunited, and a line from Greg's magnum opus, Let Me Drive My Van Into Your Heart. Number 100. Steven's actual middle name is Quartz, but when he says his name is... Steven Quartz Cutie Pie DeMeo Diamond Universe. He's referencing, in order, a joke Garnet made way back in season one. Danger is my middle name. That's a lie. Your middle name is Cutie Pie. <laughs> Greg's last name before he changed it to Universe. Andy DeMail. Greg DeMail. Stephen DeMail. We're the DeMails. And the fact that his mom turned out to not be a quartz, but well, a diamond. Number 101. Many fans have wondered exactly what's going on with Steven's glowing pinkness. Sugar points out in Growing Pains that the series says specifically that Steven is experiencing the gem equivalent of cortisol, which in humans is basically your built-in alarm system and helps fuel people's fight or flight instinct. Number 102. From the beginning, Sugar in the show itself has been interested in discussing mental health. Sugar has discussed how her own work in therapy has helped her process her anxiety. We see Steven dealing with similar things. The song Stronger Than You and Here Comes a thought or about working through anxiety in a healthy way. Number 103. Steven's traumatic experiences would come to a head in fragments. After struggling with his powers, Steven goes to train with Jasper and commits his first, and hopefully only, shattering of a gem. The following scene of resurrecting Jasper quite geniusly parallels the first sequence we see in future, kinda corrupting the innocence of the uncorrupting that this process is for. Anyway, number 104. In the following episode, Everything's Fine, Steven calls himself a monster and then literally turns into a pink gem Godzilla. Then, in I Am My Monster, the climactic battle of the series begins. Interestingly enough, it's the only episode outside of Steven's point of view that isn't someone recounting an event to him. Number 105. There's a bittersweet detail hidden in the series finale, The Future. Onion can be seen wearing the cheeseburger backpack as he waves goodbye to Steven. Elise has gone to a good home, but it is Onion, so maybe I shouldn't assume. Knowing Onion, he might have stolen. I, I don't know. Number 106. What better way to end a beloved series than with a song? As Steven heads out on his road trip, he plays on the radio Being Human, which Sugar considers the song of the final episode. Sugar says that she wanted the weight of it not to just be that you're hearing it in the episode itself, but that it's been on the horizon for you this whole time. The end credits, and fittingly end series song, was written by Sugar and performed by singer-songwriter Emily King. King's Can't Hold Me was also featured in Bismuth Casual. And number 107. Sugar's note ahead of the premiere of the final 10 episodes was beautifully heartfelt. Quote, It has been an eye-opening experience to meet the community that has come together around the show. I have been so moved and have felt so seen. Though our epilogue series is coming to a close, please trust that like us, these characters will always be growing, changing, and supporting each other. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching our show. And that, my friends, is 107 facts about Steven Universe the movie and Steven Universe Future. The name Steven means absolutely nothing to me anymore. I've said it so many times in the last however long this video is. Thank you so much for watching. For more deep dives on your favorite cartoons like this one, subscribe to Channel Frederator. I've been your host, Jacob. Be sure to love yourself in these times. And remember, of course, Frederator loves you.